Good afternoon, everybody. Good afternoon. Is everyone doing okay? We welcome everyone to the Hispanic Women's Organization Conference. I hope all of you are having an amazing time. If you can all try to make your way to your tables, we're going to get started with our program. All right, so now again, uh, we're, we're very happy to be here. We are a member of the media, and we're both happen to be Hispanic. My name is Jose Lopez. I am editor of La Prensa Libre, which is part of NWA Media, and my partner is? I'm Jocelyn Pruna. I'm a reporter for Five News. is a CBS affiliate here in Northwest Arkansas. We also cover the River Valley, and I also happen to be Hispanic. Very proud of my roots, and I'm so happy to be here. So Jocelyn, uh, What's your experience with HWA? Like, you've been involved in and out with them throughout the years. Like, can you tell me something about what you've done? Well, I feel so weird being interviewed right now. I'm used <laughs> to being on the other side. But HWOA, I worked with them one summer uh, with a program in the middle schools and junior highs where I taught kids how to have goals and what's the proper steps that you should take to accomplish your dreams, Excellent. which is something that is very hard, but it's possible. Excellent. Most, most and how about you, Jose? Oh, well, I've been lucky to know Margarita for several, several years. Um, you guys all know Margarita Salorzano, executive director. Um, I was also a lucky recipient of a scholarship in 2011. And now that I am editor, uh, Margarita is one of my contacts to keep the community up to date on what they can do to get involved as citizens, as participants of this community. And so I speak for both of us. We're very happy to be here. Absolutely. And we're going to introduce a video. It's called A Promise of Freedom. So if you can all listen. The applicants to take the oath of allegiance today, representing 56 different nationalities. Ecuador. Somalia, France. What makes us Americans? China. And what makes people from all over the world Iraq. want to become U.S. citizens? Senegal. The U.S. Constitution, Vietnam. a four-page document written more than 200 years ago, Mexico. is part of the reason. We the people. These are the first three words of the United States Constitution a document that defines the structure of the U.S. government and is the foundation for the freedoms and responsibilities of U.S. citizens. In the United States, a country with people of many different backgrounds, the principles of our Constitution unite all of us as a nation. Three hundred years ago, the early 1700s, Although Native Americans had lived in this land for centuries, the European settlers who came here called this the New World. These early settlers were drawn here for many of the same reasons that immigrants come here today. These people formed 13 colonies, ruled by Great Britain. At first, Britain allowed these colonists to govern themselves in many ways. Later, Britain made many demands on the colonists, including taxing them without their consent. As the colonists established their lives and built communities here, it became more and more important to them to be able to govern themselves. In 1776, representatives from the colonies issued a Declaration of Independence. Thomas Jefferson was the primary author of this document and later became the third president of the United States. The Declaration of Independence announced that the colonies were free and independent states, no longer under British rule. It stated that all men are created equal and are born with the natural right to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Over time, the idea of equal rights included all people in the United States. Of the 56 men who signed their names to the Declaration of Independence, eight were foreign born. They were immigrants, like many people in the United States today. The colonists 
pledged everything they owned. They pledged their honor and even their lives in order to win independence from Britain. To free themselves from British rule, colonists had to fight the most powerful army in the world. The American Revolutionary War was a hard, brutal struggle, with ongoing battles for eight violent years. George Washington commanded the colonists' army, later becoming the first president of the United States. Out of this hard-fought war, a young country was born. But there were problems. The revolution had produced 13 independent states held together by a treaty called the Articles of Confederation. The 13 states were not a unified country yet. They needed a stronger agreement to tie them together and to ensure the survival of this country. To find a solution to this problem, a convention was called in 1787, and delegates from the new independent American states met in Philadelphia. The delegates were passionate about protecting the idea that here, no one is born a ruler. They felt power must come from the people. The challenge facing the delegates was complex. They wanted to create a government strong enough to hold the entire country together, but limited enough that the rights of the states and the individual freedoms of the citizens could be protected. After three and a half months of intense debate, the delegates created a plan, a constitution, that defined a completely new kind of government. First, they put aside the idea that there would be a single, final authority, a king or an emperor, for example. Instead, they divided power between the states and a new national government, whose powers would be specific and limited. Then, within the national government, the delegates further divided power into three branches, Congress, the presidency, and the judiciary. Each of these would have its own role, but none would have total control. This is what no country had ever done. Control power by dividing it, putting it under the limits of a written constitution, and then placing the final authority with the people, who govern themselves through elected representatives. The power and responsibility for freedom belong to us. The citizens of the United States we the people. The Constitution is a document as relevant today as the day it was signed. Over the years, the Constitution has changed through what are called amendments. The first ten amendments to the Constitution are called the Bill of Rights. Those amendments establish some very basic rights of citizens. Freedom of religion, freedom of speech, right to a fair trial, right to bear arms, and other important liberties. For more than 200 years, the U.S. Constitution has had daily impact on the lives of citizens, and over time, its promise of freedom has included more and more people. Many groups of people were denied certain freedoms in the past, but have gained equality through amendments to the U.S. Constitution. It took 75 years and a civil war to end slavery. And it was another 100 years until laws were passed to make it illegal to discriminate against people based on race, color, religion, sex, or national origin. In 1965, the Voting Rights Act made sure that every U.S. citizen would be allowed to vote. At the same time, 
the United States removed many unfair restrictions on immigration. This allowed legal immigrants from all over the world to come to America and make this country their home. From early settlers to today's immigrants, the freedoms guaranteed by the U.S. Constitution have drawn many people to this country. With each person who joins the nation, we the people become stronger. Together, we have built a free nation. We have been able to imagine, invent, and live our lives as we choose. We've been free to dream and make those dreams become real. All the while, we continue to debate, as the delegates did, the challenges that face a free nation. The Constitution protects our many freedoms. It also allows each person to decide how to use these freedoms. Whether you are a new immigrant or ready to apply for citizenship, freedoms and rights come with important responsibilities. Make a commitment to be part of your community. Get to know and help your neighbors. Discuss the issues that affect your community. Learn English. Learn about U.S. history and government and respect the law. If you become a U.S. citizen, serve on a jury if you're called to do so, and vote. The right to vote allows each citizen to help the nation remain strong and grow. Voting allows all of us to have a voice in how our lives and communities are built and how they change over time. Voting is an important part of U.S. citizens' responsibilities. What makes us U.S. citizens? What makes us a nation? Why did you come to this land? Each of these questions reaches far into our shared history, to the birth of the United States, and to the document that protects and ensures our freedoms, the U.S. Constitution. And it begins with three words, we the people. Six countries that are here to become citizens today. The time has now come for you to take the oath of allegiance. This is a serious time in your life. Through these words and the guarantees of the Constitution, we are a nation of free men and women, men and women united by a shared history and the common civic values that make us all Americans. Now it is your decision. What will you do with freedom? I say thank you. Our country now is better off than our country was a few minutes ago. Now, do you feel inspired after that video, or what? I think so. Definitely. It was an amazing video. Absolutely. And now we'd like to welcome the Amer American Legion Post number 100 for the posting of the colors.
Now we would like to welcome the Springdale High School Choir to sing the national anthem. stripes and bright stars through the perilous fight. O'er the ramparts we watched were so gallantly streaming, and the rocket's red glare, the bombs bursting in air, gave proof through the night that our plan was still That was beautiful. Thank you so much to the Springdale High School Choir. So now we're going to get to our favorite part, right? That's right. One of our favorites. Food. Uh, we'd like to pl please everybody welcome the alternative learning environment, young people who have been working diligently, and they're now going to serve your food. Do you know what we're going to eat? I do not know what the menu is. You don't know what the menu is. No, it's a surprise, then. It's a surprise. I'm sure it's yummy. Well, now we'll like to uh, welcome Victor Salinas. He's El Palomito de Guanajuato. Is he around here? It's a surprise. Too. Oh, he's right there here? He is. <laughs> he snuck up on me. All right. You Everybody ready? Please give a round of welcome for El Palomito. Thank you very much. Welcome, everybody. mar de vin, yo no lo necesito, solo unas copas me bastó para entender que los amores no son buenos a la fuerza, tampoco es bueno rogarle a una mujer, aunque no niego que todas son hermosas, pero hay ingratas que no saben amar, porque un espejo refleja su belleza, luego les crece su tonta vanidad. Que yo te quiero, dijiste a tus amigas, que no te olvido ni bebiendo un mar de vino, porque me vieron tomando en la cantina, grité tu nombre cuando estaba bien bebido. Que yo te quiero, dijiste a tus amigas, que cuando quieras me tienes en tus manos. Eso es mentira, porque aunque no lo creas, si yo te quise ya se me está olvidando. Seguro que sí, chiquitita, y no creas que me traes arrastrando la cobija. Un mar de vino, yo no lo necesito, solo unas copas me bastó para sacar 
aquella espina que dejaste aquí en mi alma. Por tu cariño yo no vuelvo a tomar. Que yo te quiero, dijiste a tus amigas, que no te olvido ni bebiendo un mar de vino. Porque me vieron tomando en la cantina, grité tu nombre cuando estaba bien bebido. Que yo te quiero, dijiste a tus amigas, que cuando quieras me tienes en tus manos. Eso es mentira, porque aunque no lo creas, si yo te quise ya se me está olvidando. Thank you very much. Anes Victor Salinas, El Palomito. For me it's a pleasure to be here tonight, or this afternoon with you guys. Thank you very much. Contigo soñé y no voy a perder y no voy a rendirme hasta tenerte aquí. Mi brazo te espera para abrazarte fuerte, porque quiero tenerte muy contigo a mí. No te dejaré por ningún motivo, porque mi cariño solo es para mí. Yo quiero ser tuyo como lo he soñado y siempre a mi lado. Serás muy feliz. Te daré mi amor, todo completito. Te daré el corazón en cada besito. No dirás que no, porque tu cariño será solo mío, será solo mío y para mí solito. Enjoys their food, the desserts. Thank you very much. This, this song is called Doso de Sin Rumbo. ¿Quién dice que ando llorando? ¿Quién dice que ando gritando que me muero por tu amor? Si sabes que ando tomando Tan solo ando navegando entre copas de licor. ¿Para qué andas contando que no has de volver si vas tropezando y te vas a caer? Mejor haz de cuenta que fuimos tú y yo dos hojas sin rumbo que el viento arrastró. 
No creas que fue vacilada Cuando te tuve abrazada Juntito de aquel nopal Sentiste que te besaba Ya luego que te espinabas empezaste a llorar. Si yo ni siquiera me acuerdo de ti, ¿pa' qué andas contando que ya te perdí? Mejor has de cuenta que fuimos tú y yo, dos hojas sin rumbo que el viento arrastró. Thank you very much. God bless. Thank you, Victor. Thank you, Victor. <laughs> All right, how was that? Food. All right, now we have uh, some dignitaries that we'd like to welcome up to the to, to give a few words. And the first one we want to welcome is Bootsy Ackerman. She is the district director for Congressman Steve Womack. Thank you for being here. This is fine. This is fine. Thank you. It is an honor to be here with everyone today uh, in representing Congressman Womack, who is in Washington and couldn't be here. But he asked me to read you these words. It is my pleasure to welcome everyone who has committed their day to the Hispanic Women's Organization of Arkansas's 14th Annual Conference, We the People. The phrase, We the People, is in is the DNA of who we are as Americans. And it expresses the harmony of vision and the purpose for which our founders sought to form a more perfect union. It recognizes that the authority of government rests in the hands of the governed. In fact, the genius of our country is that we recognize the innate value and potential of every individual. So as you discuss issues of diversity, community integration, and civic participation, it is appropriate that you meet today under the banner of We the People. I applaud HWOA for hosting this conference and taking a leadership role in the state of Arkansas. HWOA's efforts to strengthen our communities through a message of inclusiveness and an appreciation of diversity are commendable. The issues spoken about today, including the keynote address by Mr. Carlos Gutierrez, former U.S. Secretary of Commerce, are important to the broader dialogue taking place on a national level. Thank you for taking time to invest yourselves in this discussion, and I know your work will result in a stronger third congressional district, which I am honored to represent. Sincerely, Steve Womack. Thank you. Thank you very much. All right, and now we'd like to please welcome Kaimara Seals, Deputy State Director for U.S. Senator Mark Pryor. Is she here? She might be MIA. Maybe she's here in spirit. How about that? Well, the next person we want to introduce is Katherine Goff. She's the field representative for Senator John Bozeman, if she's around. She's there she is. Thank you so Can much for being here. here. Thank you very much, Margarita, for inviting us today. It's always an honor and a privilege to represent Senator Bozeman 
And many of you uh, may not be aware, uh, but he sends a special greeting to Secretary Gutierrez because um, his daughter, Shannon, worked for the Secretary in Washington, D.C., and he's uh, so happy that you accepted the invitation to come to Northwest Arkansas, and he truly regrets not being able to be here today. But we know you're in great hands. We have a wonderful community, and we're relieved that our weather is cooperating, and we hope you have a wonderful stay. Thank you so much for being here today. All right, and now, now we'd like to welcome Ana Aguayo. She's the field representative, I'm sorry, external affairs liaison for the Office of Governor Mike Beebe. Ana? Thank you. Good afternoon. Um, Secretary Gutierrez, Senator Pryor, community leaders and members, it is a great privilege to be here before you to celebrate the 15th anniversary of the Hispanic Women's Organization, celebrating culture, education, and community engagement. Uh, Governor Beebe could not be here today, but on his behalf, I would like to thank the staff, volunteers, and leadership at the Hispanic Women's Organization for bringing us all together today. We mark the occasion by, make, by taking this conference as an opportunity to pause, reflect, and honor the significant role and contributions of the Hispanic community to this nation. As a community leader in education, Hispanic Women's Organization Scholarship Program has played a pivotal role in supporting Latino students further their education, awarding 312 scholarships over the past 15 years. Your commitment to education through scholarships helps us improve education, which has been Governor Beebe's top priority as governor. Today, um, Arkansas is without a doubt an increasingly diverse state. And with it, it is important to make sure that all groups have a voice to speak for them. And just as important, that leaders who will listen to them. You realize that here, and we also have that belief at the governor's office. Margarita, thank you so much for the invitation to be here. Thank you for being a spokesperson and involving the Latino community to civically be engaged. Thank you. Thank you, Anna. And now, for real, we're gonna introduce Camara Seals, she is the field, uh, I'm sorry, Deputy State Director for U.S. Senator Mark Pryor. Please give her a round of applause. Thank you. Good afternoon. My name is Camara Seals and I work for our U.S. Senator Mark Pryor. I am pleased to be here on his behalf today. Unfortunately, he could not be with us today but uh, we're so delighted to have his mom and dad with us, Senator David Pryor and Mrs. Barbara Pryor, so let's give them a round of applause. And I want to say congratulations to the Hispanic Women's Council organization for putting this on. I'm excited about this, uh, and I really like your theme, We the People. And it's so important that we be involved and, and stay involved in civic participation. And this theme in this conference is excellent in getting people engaged and getting out the message about our responsibility civically to be involved in our communities. So I look forward to the next session uh, that, that you're going to have. It's going to be a powerful, dynamic session. I look forward to it. Again, thank you for the invitation and congratulations on a successful event. I love your energy. Thank you so much for being here. I also, uh, we also wanted to recognize the uh, Chief of Police, Kathy O'Kelly, wherever for she's Springdale. At, for Springdale. Is she here? I know, I saw her. There she is. She's up. being Thank a little bashful there. over there. Thank, Thank you, you so much for being here. We're in your town. And then also Chancellor G. David Gearhart. Thank you so much for being here. We are very proud Razorbacks, by the way, University of Arkansas grads. And uh, chan the Chancellor said he wanted to call the hogs. I don't know if it's true. No, I'm just kidding. No, we're not going to do that. I think he was about to. <laughs> are we about to? 
Do you want to? Do you guys want to call the hogs? Okay. Yes or no? No, no, we're not going to call the hogs. It's just a joke. <laughs> well, um, the Razorbacks play tomorrow. Yes. We can call the hogs tomorrow then. All right, well, we're going to give you guys a few minutes to eat your food and chat a little bit, and we'll be back in about seven to ten minutes to continue the program. All right? I hope you guys have been enjoying your meal. And now we have a couple special people to welcome. And uh, please welcome uh, Ed Clifford. Welcome to the Jones Center. And we'd like to also have uh, Mayor Doug Sprouse, Mayor of Springdale, to come up. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, on behalf of the staff and the board of directors of the Jones Center, I want to welcome you. We're, as always, honored to have uh, this event at the Jones Center, uh, which has uh, been in existence since 1996 and is about as incredible a piece of community infrastructure as I have ever seen. In addition to the recreational facilities that you're in the middle of right now, many of you uh, probably are not aware that we run, we have a, a, a preschool here in the mornings or, or all day. We have uh, an after-school program run by Camp War Eagle for uh, the elementary school kids. We have a teen after-school program run by the Smeeting Center. We have 60 classes of Northwest Arkansas Community College. And we are the very proud home of the third Springdale High School, the I School, which you're, the kids are uh, serving you t today. So let's appreciate the I School students for what they do. Thanks again for being here, and I'd like to introduce Mayor Doug Sprouse. Uh, mayor Sprouse has been uh, the mayor here for six years, and I've had the opportunity to work with he and his administration and the council, and their mantra is very much similar to Jim Rollins, who's here today. Jim says, we teach all the students, and Doug says, my administration serves all the people, and the quality of life here indicates how well they do that. So. Please welcome Mayor Doug Sprouse.
thank you. I'll, I'll be very brief, and uh, certainly I want to uh, echo. I, I, anytime I get a chance to brag on the Jones Center and uh, and uh, Ed and his staff and and all the people that make the Jones Center possible, I'll, I'll sure take that opportunity because we're so so proud to have it uh, as, as such an asset, not only and a jewel, not only for Springdale but for all of Northwest Arkansas. So uh, Ed, thank you and, and your staff for all you all do. Uh, Margarita, it's a pleasure. I, I always look forward to the opportunity and thank you for the opportunity to, uh, to just do a brief welcome and I will be brief, but uh, I tell you, the, the Hispanic Women's Organization of Arkansas is, is such a tremendous organization and Margarita, your leadership and thank you again for all you all do to make lives better for the people of Arkansas. And uh, you know, it's, it's always a pleasure for me to get to, uh, to get to just be in a room like this that's filled with people who are trying to make a positive difference in the, in the lives of others. And uh, I, see, uh, I see Mayor Hines there from uh, Rogers Gregg. My friend, thank you for being here. I don't know if you were gonna get introduced, but us mayors stick together, don't we? So, uh, and, and if I'm missing a mayor, I apologize, but I saw Greg walk in and it's always a pleasure to have him in Springdale. Uh, this, uh, this city, this region, this state, this country, we certainly have problems and we certainly have issues and we certainly have challenges. But I've got to tell you, after seeing that video and hearing that uh, high school choir and, uh, and then the other singing we've had that was great, I've got to tell you, I will take our problems over anybody, any other country's problems uh, in the world. So I, we are very thankful people and we are blessed. And, uh, and to be in a room full of folks who are working to, uh, to improve things for everybody, uh, it's just a pleasure, pleasure and a privilege for me. And I tell you, as, as long as we continue to make lives, to strive and have a passion to make lives better for all of our residents, then we're gonna be a stronger country, a stronger state, and certainly a stronger city and region. So thank you again for being here. Thank you, I know this is a great uh, conference, and I know you've got some great things ahead, as was mentioned earlier this afternoon. Again, welcome to Springdale, and I uh, hope you have a great time here. I don't fix speeding tickets. Uh, if, you're, if you're new to Springdale, uh, I can't do that. If I could do that, my insurance rates would be lower too. So, uh, but, uh, but thank you. I hope you enjoy your time. If you're a first-time visitor to Springdale, I hope you have a great experience and, uh, and come back soon. Thank you. I'm not as tall. <laughs> I think that's good. Right? Thank you, Mayor Sprouse. Mayor Sprouse is always a pleasure to have him around. I always interview him and I go last minute to his office and I'm like, I need an interview right now and he's always available real quick. So I always appreciate him and thank you for that message. We are in Springdale and we feel very welcome and I hope everyone does too. And I wanted to introduce the Hispanic Women's Organization of Arkansas Board President, Marcus Spinoza. If you can come up here and he's going to present an award. Very special. Thank you, Jocelyn. Um, I have the luxury of actually doing the Community Excellence Award. And HWA annually does this Community Excellence Award, recognizing an individual in the community through his or her leadership, actions, work, influence, and attitudes that's demonstrated excellence in their service, promoting the advancement for all. Such actions and work must be inclusive and benefit not one specific group, but the whole community and the state of Arkansas. And Northwest Arkansas is quite simply in the middle of everything positive and things are happening here, changes. Jobs, education, talent, um, a growing diverse workforce, creating a unique combination of opportunities that impact our communities and our region. These factors working together bring out the best of our region and make this area recognized worldwide as the center of excellence. And under the leadership of this year's honoree, the Northwest Arkansas Council has worked to identify regional challenges and forge regional solutions for this fast-growing and dynamic region. He has brought together government, educational institutions, corporations, nonprofits, and the community at large to highlight the best of our region, helping to create a community where everybody is welcome. The person receiving the HWA Community Excellence Award is also in the middle of everything that happens from D.C. to Northwest Arkansas to Little Rock, he's all over the place, projecting the image of this great and thriving community to the world. He works with multi-level initiatives to promote economic growth, education, quality of life, diversity, and inclusion. 
The interconnectivity of bringing community and resources together makes Northwest Arkansas a unique place to live, work, and raise a family. This innovative and brilliant, vibrant area can be a national model for progress and community integration under the slogan of great for business, great for life. And I'm proud to, uh, ladies and gentlemen, bring up, recognize Mike Malone, President and CEO of the Northwest Arkansas Council with the Community Excellence Award. One thing I will tell you though, behind every uh, good man is also a great lady that brings him up. And I'm glad to recognize Allison, who's in the audience, his wife. So if everybody can give a recognition for Allison. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, Mike. So really nice. I'm flattered. Thank you. Well, thank you so much, friends and neighbors. Uh, I, I like to think I've got some humility, but I, I'm really humbled by that, the introduction and the recognition. And I'm also self-conscious enough to know that uh, this, is, this is misnamed. Uh, you've named it the Community Excellence Award, but really doing the kind of work I do, it's easy to do when you're in an excellent community. And so uh, we, uh, what I do and what our organization does and what our members let us do and tell us to do, it only works when we, the people of Northwest Arkansas, partner together uh, find ways to find common ground and common opportunities to make the place better, to overcome challenges, and to build on our opportunities. And so we're in a room full of uh, should-be award recipients because we're an excellent community and we're all a part of the Community Excellence Award. So I thank you for recognizing me, but I want to recognize what we all do every day to make Northwest Arkansas a great place to live and work. So thank you very, very much. Appreciate it. All right, now uh, it's time to thank some sponsors. So we'd like to please welcome Kelly Zega from Cox Com Communications to make a few brief remarks. Buenos dias. How is everybody? <laughs> Um, as was said, my name is Kelly Zega. I work for Cox Communications, and we have been investing for many years in the Hispanic Women's Organization of Arkansas. And the reason for that is really because it's about community. And as we've been hearing a little bit today about we the people, to me, there's nothing that manifests itself more personally and more specifically, we the people, than how we live and work and play and and grow benefits within our own communities. So as I was thinking about community today, what came to my mind was actually a quote that I remember hearing by Mother Teresa. And that was a woman who knew how to make great quotes. Her quote is this, we know only too well that what we are doing is nothing more than a drop in the ocean. But if the drop were not there, the ocean would be missing something. I think that is such a relevant quote because each one of us in this room is an individual drop through the various actions that we take, the investments that we make in our community, what we learn, what, how we grow. All of those things are drops. And you think about each one of us, we keep adding our drops to that ocean. And then the people that we touch, they keep adding their drops. And suddenly we actually do have an ocean. And so if you think about what your individual impact is, it can be great, it can be small, but it's an impact no matter how you look at it. And so I want to issue a challenge to all of you to keep putting those drops in the ocean, keep investing in this community, keep welcoming people, making people feel included, involved, and get involved yourself. And we are going to continue to grow as a place that people want to live and learn and play and raise their families. So thank you so much for, for involving us today and everybody have a wonderful rest of the conference. Thank you. Thank you, Kelly. So she's from Cox Communications. We appreciate your support to this conference. It wouldn't be possible without you. And another uh, corporate sponsor that we have that's very important is Walmart. So I'm going to invite Pepe Estrada to come up here and say a few words. And thank you again for your support. Good afternoon. Uh, so this morning as I was uh, getting ready to leave the house, I went ahead and asked my children, and some of you know them, 
what, what makes this country great? And here's what they came up with. Um, they told me that what makes this country great are four concepts. Diversity, education, our winning attitude, and freedom. And I completely agree with them. I think that is exactly what makes this country great. I think that's what our forefathers set out to help us understand when they declared independence uh, from uh, the United Kingdom or from Britain back then, right? And it's the pursuit of happiness. The pursuit of happiness is the American dream. What they never promised us was that the pursuit of the American dream was going to be easy. Throughout the centuries, if you study our history, the pursuit of the American dream has always been a challenging job. It takes a lot of effort to get where we all want to be and achieve whatever dream that is that we, we have for ourselves. So with that in mind, I want to challenge you all because what we have, what we enjoy today is the product of hard work by the men and women in our military, by the men and women that are helping rebuild our highways, and all the people in between. So to honor them, my challenge to you is to participate civically. And what I'm talking about is I want every single one of you to find two individuals that are able to vote and make sure they vote this November. And in turn, challenge every single one of those two individuals to find two more individuals that have never voted and make sure that they vote. I challenge you to do that. That is one way in which we can honor the people that have worked throughout the centuries to make our nation what it is today. So with that, thank you for being here and thank you for supporting the Hispanic Women's Organization of Arkansas. Thank you. All right, and now finally, we'd like to welcome a uh, representative from Tyson Foods Incorporated, another fine sponsor of this event. Uh, please welcome Mr. Ed Nicholson. Hi there. I'm, I'm Jeff Wood. Ed was ill today, but it's my pleasure to be here. And... Um, We'd like to say that, um, you know, one of the things that makes Tyson Foods a great company is our diversity, and we're very proud of that. We're, we're very excited to have the secretary here today. Uh, we're very proud to support the Hispanic Women's Organization for a long time. And more than anything else, we'd just like to say to Margarita, thank you for what you do to make this home that we all share a better place, a better community for everyone. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Rafael Arciga. I'm the president of the board for the Hispanic Women's Organization of Arkansas, and I want to uh, thank you for being here and supporting uh, the organization. Um, I'm not going to sing, so you're, you're, you're good. I have the pleasure to introduce today's uh, keynote speaker, uh, former Secretary of Commerce, uh, Mr. Carlos Gutierrez. His currently the chair of the Albright Stonebridge Group, the premier strategic, strategic advisory and commercial diplomacy firm. He spent 30 years with the Kellogg Corporation. He also served as the U.S. Secretary of Commerce from 2005 to 2009 under President George W. Bush. He was responsible for heading a cabinet agency with almost 40,000 employees and a $6.5 million budget focused on promoting American business at home and all around the world. Mr. Gutierrez, an immigrant, reminds us that immigrants are not a single issue, single party community. He knows the different languages between business, government, and civil society. And that's a vital, a vital understanding that we all, as a community, can work together as we the people. He is a leader of the Republicans for Immigration Reform and offers a lot of lessons 
on ones whose life brought him from Cuba to be part and serve as the Secretary of Commerce of the most powerful nation in the world. Ladies and gentlemen, it's a pleasure to introduce former Secretary of Commerce, Carlos Gutierrez. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. That's very kind. Thank you. Thank you. And it's a, it's a real honor to be here. I've uh, come to Arkansas a lot when I was with the Kellogg Company. Obviously, our biggest customer is here. Uh, but I had never been out in the community, and it's been a real privilege to meet people and just get a sense of, of the spirit of, of, of the community. So I, I thank you also for that opportunity, and Margarita, thank you for uh, inviting me to be here. You know, when we talk about Hispanics and Hispanic leadership and um, Hispanic Americans in society, the conversation tends to be about representation. So it's, you know, what are Hispanics represented on boards of directors? Are Hispanics uh, represented in the executive ranks of companies? It's all about representation, being there. Um, and that's a great start. And I think that's a great thing to focus on. And there are a lot of organizations that focus on that. But I would say that we should, we should set our sights on a new mission, a new goal. And that is to occupy the ranks of leadership. Not just to be present, not just to be represented, but to be in a position where we can lead. Um, I'm gonna give you a, a little story uh, that happened to me when I was in Mexico. I started my career in Mexico City. We came from Cuba, we went to Miami, New York, we became U.S. citizens, and then my father got a job in Mexico, so we moved to Mexico. So I studied junior high school, high school, and started my Kellogg Company career um, in, in Mexico City as well. So some years had gone by, and I made my way to uh, being general manager of Kellogg Mexico, and I did that job for five years. And one day I was talking to my boss and I said, you know, I've been here for five years, I think we've done pretty well, and I'd like to move. I'd like to go on to something else and, and, and go on to bigger things. And he said, well, what are you, what are you thinking about? What, what kind of a job were you thinking about? I said, well, I'd like to run an Anglo market. And we, we used to call the U.S., Canada, U.K., Australia, which are the big cereal markets, the big per capita consumption markets, the Anglo markets. So that's kind of a Kellogg terminology. And I said, I, I want to run one of the Anglo markets. And, uh, and he was uh, kind of surprised. And he, you know, his reply was, are you sure? Uh, don't you want to be vice president of Latin America? And he, he kept asking me that kind of quiet, you sure you want to do that? And look, I mean, you could be a VP in Latin America and all these countries. And what I didn't get until after the conversation and after I thought about the conversation is that what he was really asking me was, do you really think that as a Latino, you can lead Anglos? Why don't you play it safe and just be the Latin American guy and lead Latin Americans. And um, I think today, as we think about Hispanic women, you probably face the same question or the same doubt. Can women lead men? Can Hispanic women lead Anglo men? And um, I would submit to you that always keep in mind that the answer to that question is yes. Yes, you can lead people of different backgrounds and people that are different than you are. Um, so it's all about leadership. 
So I'd like to tell you what I've learned about leadership by observing great leaders, by just watching the way great leaders operate. And uh, they all have similar traits. Uh, and I'll tell you something, I have met great um, Anglo leaders. I have met great Hispanic leaders. Some of the greatest leaders I started the company with were in Mexico. I've met great African-American leaders. I've met great Asian leaders. I've met leaders that are, who are tall, others who are short. I've met leaders who are thin. I've met some who are not so thin. Um, I've met leaders who are extroverts, and I've met leaders who are painfully shy. So there's no special, um, you know, physical or gender or personality trait that's going to make a great leader. Uh, yes, yeah, some people are born with great talent, and, but it doesn't mean that if you're not born with those specific talents that you can't grow to be a great leader. I have seen it. So um, the, there is no screening process. Everyone has a shot. And let me tell you about four traits that I've observed. Four traits that at least all of the great leaders I could think about have shown these traits. They have other traits, they have, you know, um, each of them have individual characteristics, but they all had these four things. Um, the first one is they all had a tremendous will to lead. You know, I, I know a lot of people who like to be the boss, but that doesn't mean that they have the will to lead. That they actually enjoy the daily struggle and grind of being a leader. You know, they actually enjoy coming into the office and feeling the pressure um, and not walking away from problems, but actually walking towards problems. And they enjoy having the weight of their organization on their shoulders. They have tremendous will. Um, and I think about women and the will that women have to show in their daily lives to balance family and work and kids, that is an exercise of sheer will. So there's no question that you have that will. And, it, and if you have the will to make all those things work, uh, I can assure you that you have the will to lead. The other thing about great leaders is that they all believe in something bigger than themselves. Uh, if people think that you're in it for yourself, that this is all about you, that you're only thinking about your promotion, that everything is centered on your life. They'll work for you because they probably need the job, but I don't think they'll follow you. And there's nothing more demotivating than people to think that they're working for someone who only cares about themselves. So the great leaders who I've observed, they always think of something bigger. They believe in something bigger, whether it's the institution whether it's the project that they're leading, whether it's the department that they head, whether it's the team, whether it's the cause, whether it's the constitution, but it's something bigger than just that one leader. Um, and I'll tell you, when people see that, when people see that you believe in something bigger than yourself, it's incredibly inspiring. And, and it, it, it motivates people to be to, to want to follow you and to admire you because you put something ahead of your own self-interest. Again, um, I think of women, uh, whether it's uh, obviously today we're talking about Hispanic women, and I have 
obviously I grew up in a Hispanic household, um, so I grew up with Hispanic women, um, starting with uh, my mother and my grandmother. I don't have any sisters, uh, but I've observed this. If, if you think about a woman's life, they all believe in something bigger than themselves. It's all about the family, the work, the children, keeping it together. Um, it's very hard to find a self-centered, selfish woman. And I don't say that to try to ingratiate myself with you, but think about that. It's, it's the weight of everything that you're carrying. So you have that trait, um, and it actually comes pretty natural. The family, the relatives, the kids, the community. Um, I'm not sure I can say that about all men, but, um, and I feel I can say that because I am a man, so, you know, it, but, um, but I think it's more prevalent among women. A third trait, which is uh, for me uh, incredibly uh, key, and I tell you, I wish I would have known this 30 years ago, but it's, it's being self-aware, self-awareness. Great leaders know who they are and who they are not. They know what they're good at and they know what they're not good at. They understand themselves. Um, when I started leading people, I was unbearable. And I didn't realize that till later. I thought that if you're the leader, you have to have every answer, you have to do all the talking, you have to win every argument, because you're the leader. That's what leaders do. You know, that's, that's, that's what taking charge is all about. Uh, the real job of the leader is to understand themselves, what they're good at, what they're not good at. No one is good at everything. And then surround yourself with people who are good at things that you're not good at. Surround yourself with people who complement your own skills. Um, once you get to that point, it just, it, there's, it's almost peace of mind because you get to the point where, you know what? I am comfortable with who I am. And I am comfortable and I have the self-confidence to know who I am and what I do well and what I don't. But look at my team. And this is why diversity is so important. Because you need that different, um, different perspective. Uh, imagine a team uh, of introverts, right? If you chose a team and you're an introvert, so I'm going to surround myself with people who are just like me. Um, and you have a meeting, I don't, I don't think they talk a lot at that meeting, right? Because they're all kind of shy. And, um, a team of all white males, are there going to be real differences and different points of view? Uh, a team that is trying to appeal to the Hispanic community, but they don't have any Hispanic executives. Um, but it's, it's the self-awareness that drives you to understanding that you need diversity, not because it's fashionable and not because you're supposed to have a diverse team, but because you need a diverse team. And that self-awareness will make you vulnerable. And, and I'll tell you, people love vulnerable leaders. People love leaders who understand that, that they're just as human as everybody else. Um, but, it, but it's a tremendous sign of self-confidence. Uh, let me tell you another story about what helped me in, in my career. I had a secret weapon. Uh, and that secret weapon was I had a role model, and uh, that role model was a gentleman by the name of Roberto Goizueta. 
and uh, I've, I've told the story twice already, so I'm sorry if you've heard it before, but I was uh, running Kellogg Mexico. I was in my early 30s, and I picked up a copy of Fortune magazine, and there on the cover, it has a picture of this Cuban-American who had just become CEO, chairman and CEO of the Coca-Cola company. I couldn't believe it. But what that did for me is it gave me someone to follow. And I, for the rest of my career, I couldn't get enough to read about this man. I read everything written about him. I read everything written about the Coca-Cola company. I think I knew as much about Coca-Cola as I did about Kellogg's because I had someone to look to. I had someone who had shown me the way. And I can't tell you how powerful that was. Now, Roberto was Cuban-American. He had a very strong Cuban accent when he spoke English. And he was a, a bit, I would say, on the introverted side. So he wasn't a big public speaker, and he wasn't a backslapper, and uh, he was a very thoughtful man, and he was very good at financial strategy. I mean, he was, he was amazing. So, um, as his number two, because he understood himself and he understood what he was good at and what he wasn't good at, he picked as his number two person, as his COO, chief operating officer, a back-slapping, extroverted, great speaker as his president. So, an example of self-awareness. But the amazing thing for me is that Don Quixote, who was Roberto's number two man and his right-hand man, was his competitor for the top job. And there were people on the board who thought that the job should have gone to Don Quixote. But he named him president and COO. Why? Because for Roberto, there was nothing more important than the Coca-Cola company. He believed in something bigger than himself. That institution was his life. That institution gave him a career. And he believed that his role was to preserve and grow and make that institution prosper. And you saw it in his actions. And he was a trip. And you look back at that time period from about 1984 to 1996 when they were together. And it was one of the greatest periods of the Coca-Cola company in terms of results, in terms of, of, of actually making it work. And you talk to people from Coke, say, did you know Roberto? Well, I didn't know him that much because he's a little bit shy. And, but we loved him because we knew that he was always thinking about the well-being of the institution. The last thing is simplicity. Uh, leaders, great leaders don't confuse complexity with sophistication, okay? Um, leaders communicate, they don't try to impress. Um, I, I, I know many of you have been in meetings where a person comes in to make a presentation and they have you know this 45 minute PowerPoint and they've got charts with arrows and circles and uh, confusing numbers and uh, very complicated and, and nobody's asking a question because people are thinking, boy, if, if, I, if I ask a question that's gonna show that I don't understand this very sophisticated stuff he's presenting. No wonder he's an executive vice president. He understands this, 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 these charts. The problem is nobody else understood them. So they walked out of the meeting and they didn't know what to do. They didn't know what the charge was because this executive he was trying to show them how smart he was. And he was trying to make those charts so complicated. Um, since we're in, uh, in Arkansas, the home of Walmart, I've got to tell you this story, and I know there's some people from Walmart here. 
I came to a meeting, one of those Saturday meetings uh, a while back when I was at Kellogg. And um, the CEO at that time was David Glass. He, he got up and presented some charts. And uh, the, these were big concepts. This was like the strategy of the company. And one chart said, show them the price. And I was saying, like, what is this? You know, this, is this Walmart? I mean, it, it sounds like it's a, a little store, a little, a little corner store. Show them the price. Is that really a strategy? But what that meant and what it means, and I don't know if they still use this, but it meant when you walk into a Walmart store, what you're going to see is a lot of displays and a lot of big signs that show you that they've got some great prices. It's all about merchandising. And anytime you walk into a Walmart store, the first thing you do is you probably trip over a display or a big sign that says $1.99. It's merchandising, it's marketing, it's what they do for a living. Show them the price. The second thing they put up, it was a chart that said, take the customer's money. Well, what the heck is that? You know, I'm always used to seeing these complicated charts and, you know, arrows and circles and, for them, it meant that customers shouldn't be waiting in line for too long. So that if a customer is waiting in line for a certain amount of time, there's a likelihood that that person won't come back, or there's even a likelihood that the person will say, you know what, I'm out of here. I don't have time to wait in line. So make sure you have enough aisles open so that customers can get in, buy their product, pay at the cashier, and leave. So for me, it was just an incredible example of a company that didn't confuse complexity with sophistication. And you look at the success of Walmart today. The, the, the one other thing I would say, uh, especially to Hispanics, Hispanic women, uh, whatever job you do, you are in business and you are a business person and don't let anyone kind of pigeonhole you as there's the business and then there's you there's the business people the people who understand the numbers and the people who run the show and then we have uh, you know a hispanic woman who does something else now you're a business person and learn the language of business and be as much as a, of a business person as anyone else in the company. Um, because if not, then it's too easy. It's too easy to, to let people put you in a spot and keep you there. I was on a panel the other day for women on boards of directors. And we were talking about why aren't there more women on boards of directors and what can companies do and uh, what, what is the problem? And I, and I mentioned, look, I, I sit on a board where the lead director is a woman, uh, the chair of the audit committee uh, is a woman in another board, and in one board, the chair of the nominating corporate governance committee is a woman. And, uh, and, and people talked about how, you know, women bring a certain perspective and they're different than men, and, and, and that's all true. Um, but I'll tell you one thing that stood out uh, from that, from my experience on boards, is that I never saw an ill-prepared woman. I never, I, I never sensed that, boy, she didn't come, she didn't read the book. A lot of men who went there and tried to, you know, wing it and ask a couple of good questions, and it, but the women were prepared, and, and why? Perhaps it's because they know that they're underrepresented. Um, perhaps they feel like I've got to prove myself. Um, and you know what? I don't think that's all that bad. I think it could be an advantage. It could be an extra motivator, especially if you're a Hispanic woman, then you have two things to prove. And if that means that you, are, you work a little bit harder and you get more prepared than the others, that's fine. That's just part of the price that we're all paying. 
It's part of our role. It's what other people have done before us. It's what other immigrant groups have done before us. And that's just the way it's, it's done. Uh, but but don't, don't see that as a disadvantage. Um, I'm just going to close out with another story. I was, uh, I was once at an off-site uh, about diversity. And one of the top executives was talking about work-life balance, okay? And how work-life balance is also a responsibility of the employee not just the company, but the employee has a responsibility for work-life balance. Um, and this person was a, uh, a very high executive, a very, very senior executive. And, um, and he said, for example, if one day you have a, your son or your daughter has a softball game or a little league game, just tell your boss, hey, boss, today I'm leaving at 3 o'clock because I want to go see my, my son's Little League game. And it just hit me. I had never been to a Little League game with my son. And as I think about why, it's probably because I didn't want people to say, yeah, of course, this guy, he's Cuban. All, that's all Cubans like is baseball. So he takes the afternoon off and he goes to a Little League game. So I look back and I say, do I regret that? That's probably just the price that you have to pay. It's probably just an immigrant's experience in trying to break through, in trying to ensure that they are never, never underestimated. Um, so we do have an added burden. And Hispanic women have double that burden. You're a woman and you're Hispanic. And our role is to prove ourselves. We have to do that. It's just part of, it's part of what we're confronting. It's part of our struggle. It's part of our challenge. And so many trailblazers before us have had to do the same thing. And now it's our turn. There's one thing that I'm convinced of is that we're going to see a lot of Hispanic women in leadership positions. It may not be tomorrow, but just keep looking and keep looking around and find one that you would like to emulate and learn everything you can about her. Read about her. Watch how she dresses, how she walks, how she talks, why she got to where she got. And that will be an, an amazing, powerful tool for you as a Hispanic woman as well. Um, and I am also convinced that this wave of Hispanic immigration is going to make this a better country. And our job is to make sure that we demonstrate that and not allow anyone to pigeonhole you. Oh, you're a Hispanic woman, fine. We're going to bring you in and, you know, it's good to have you, but we're going to put you over here. No. You want to be in the mainstream. You want to be leading. You want to be in the center of things. And if they don't put you there, they find your way there. But that's... That's the way that we've got to go about this. So um, I hope I've given you something to think about. It's been a real honor to be here. Um, I'll, for, I'll, I'll uh, remember this, this trip to, to Bentonville, to Fayetteville fondly. Um, and thank you for your hospitality. Thank you very much. Um, to conclude our lunch hour program, we're going to present a certificate to the secretary. 
there's an old story here in Arkansas for these native Arkansans, of which I'm one. For a long time, we've been known for our love of our beautiful state and our hospitality. And the certificate that we're presenting expresses our appreciation for people who come to our state, who like our state, and who say good things about our state when they go back home. A long time ago, about 200 years ago, the story of the Arkansas traveler is that Colonel Sandy Faulkner was traveling through the back country, and he was tired and hungry, and he came upon a squatter's cabin. And the old man that lived there was sitting in the doorway playing the first part of a fiddle tune. And he played the first part over and over and over. Colonel Faulkner asked him why he didn't play the rest of it. And he said, I don't know the rest of it. So Colonel Faulkner borrowed his fiddle and he played the rest of the tune. The squatter's tone changed then. He offered him all kinds of hospitality, told him he could stay as long as he wanted to. And like that traveler long ago, we hope that we've shown you a good time and some hospitality and that when you go back home, you'll have good things to say about Arkansas. So I'd like to ask the rest of the board of directors to join me and Margarita. We have Alejandro, Mark, and Rafael. And on behalf of the organization, we're proud to give you the Arkansas Traveler you. Certificate. And thank you so much for coming and sharing your talents with us. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Thank you all for a wonderful lunch. Uh, closing remarks, Jocelyn? Yes, well, I have several things I wanted to point out. I was paying attention, I was being a good reporter, and I took some notes. I remember Kelly from Cox Communications who said, you know, the importance of making that impact. So I'm, I remember that, and I hope everyone else does. Also, Ed from Tyson, the importance of diversity. And then Pepe, he challenged us to go vote. So there are a lot of things I remembered and we're taking away from this and it's been a pleasure being one of your MCs and next to Jose who's a really good friend of mine. Yes, likewise and uh, we'd like to invite you to visit the booths here. Uh, several people who are involved with the community are right here and then of course there's the last session. session. Uh, you want to say what it is? Sure, Jessica? the power, our voices, our votes. So thank you very much for coming and being part of the 14th Annual Hispanic Women's Organization of Arkansas Conference. Thank you all. Have a good day.